welcome. Today, I would like to do a tribute to David Tobias Theodore Bamberg, also known as Fu Manchu. Uh, David Bamberg was the last in a line of Bamberg magicians. Now, this was called a dynasty. There have, been in, there have been many magic dynasties, but to my mind, there are three primary dynasties that as a magic historian, you should be aware of and taking an interest in. So there's the Herman dynasty. Alexander Herman, of course, was probably the first great illusionist in the United States back at the, before the turn of the last century in the late 1800s. His, uh, his wife, Adelaide Herman, continued to show after his death. Uh, but the Hermans uh, were a magic dynasty. And by a dynasty, I mean magic passed from generation to generation. And that is a dynasty. <clears throat> then you have the Masculines in England. Uh, the Masculines were a magic dynasty. And then you have the Bambergs. And, uh, and David Tobias Bamberg was the last in the line of the great Bamberg magicians. He was born February 19th, 1904. By the way, this is a picture of him very young, of course. Uh, he passed away on August 19th, 1974. He was 70 years old. David was the sixth and final member of the Bamberg magical dynasty. Uh, they were a Dutch family of conjurers whose magical lineage was passed from each generation. Uh, actually, in this case, firstborn sons, which is, uh, I don't know if that's unusual or not, but that's the way it was in this particular dynasty. His father was Tobias Theo Bamberg, otherwise known as Okito. Now, to anyone, anyone interested in, in the history of magic is going to know who Okito was. Uh, I have some things I want to share with you about Okito um, that are rather serious, but, but we'll get to that in a few moments. Uh, the Bamberg magical dynasty included Jasper Bamberg. He, he performed in the early part of the 18th century. E Eliza Bamberg, 1760 to 1833. And then you have actually three David Bambergs separated by two Tobias Bambergs. Isn't that, you know? But the, it's the last two Bambergs that I really want to focus on in this presentation. David Bamberg is my focus, but his father, Okido, uh, plays very prominently into what I want to share with you. Uh, Bamberg performed his first trick in public when he was five years old at the Society of American Magicians meeting at a Martin, well actually at, he performed at a, at a uh, club, I, I think a, a, a retirement dinner or a, a ladies club or something like that uh, before he did the SAM show, but he was learning magic and this is, this is a great story I want to share with you. So and this is, this is a young David Bamberg. So, so he's, he's learning magic. Now his dad's teaching him Okido, the great Okido is teaching his son to do magic. And, uh, and they go to the Society of American Magicians meeting. Now, they're living in New York at the time. Okido had been performing for many years and uh, had decided to open a magic shop in, in, in New York. Now, he was obviously uh, competing with Martinka, but he was doing his own thing. He was making his own props. And, uh, and so they would go to Martinka's for the uh, SAM meetings as most magicians do, even today. So, so they're at Martinka. Now, if you don't know Martinka, I need to do a, I need to do a separate presentation on Martinka. It's one of, it's probably the longest running magic shop in the world. Uh, I believe Martinka's is still open. It's passed obviously from owner to owner, had different owners over the years. Uh, it's gone out of business, it's come back into business, but uh, it's been around forever. And at this particular time, which has been the early 20th century, late 19th century, that period, Martinkas was second to none. Uh, Martinkas was a, 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 a wonderful magic shop. And, and Denny used to say to me, David, you know, if you want to excite uh, people who deal in magic antiquities, tell them that you're interested in collecting Martinka. Um, because it's expensive, uh, magic collectors uh, will pay top dollar for Martinka material, and and still today, when I I've looked at their catalog online, they have they have wonderful stuff. So here he is. I mean, imagine this: Okido, the great Okido, is taking his young son to the Society of American Magicians meeting, 
where his young son is going to present, arguably, maybe his first time, maybe not, but very early on in his performance career. So, young David Bamberg goes up to the front, all magicians now, and he asks for a volunteer. And guess who volunteers? Harry Houdini volunteers. So, <laughs> Harry Houdini comes up to assist young David Bamberg. And Harry Houdini, by the way, was the, was the uh, early president of the Society of American Magicians. So he comes up and he helps David Bamberg perform in front of a house full of magicians. I just think that's a wonderful story. I just love it. Uh, I, I can't imagine uh, being, being little David Bamberg wanting to do your first card trick or whatever it was he performed and, and saying, I need a volunteer from the audience and here comes Harry Houdini. So, good for you, David Bamberg. <clears throat> this is a picture of, um, of Okito. Okito, uh, Tobias Bamberg, and David Bamberg as Fu Manchu. Now, they both developed a, um, an Asian style of performing. And, and to today's audiences, uh, you're going to look at this and say, oh, it's cultural appropriation. You know, it's... It's, uh, it's, it's, in our day and age, it has become uh, socially unacceptable or um, politically incorrect, if you will, to, to adopt a culture that is not your own. Uh, there's lots of, uh, lots of criticism. I, I, I'm, I'm not, by the way, I'm not uh, a critic of that. I, I'm not an exponent of that. I just, I just mention it because it's likely that somebody's going to watch this video and, and, and pick up on that. And I want to address it. I want to address why they developed this particular style and, and, uh, <clears throat> and what it meant to them and what, what their purpose was in doing it so that, so that you, you, you sort of get that it, it wasn't, they, they didn't mean anything, they didn't mean anything um, uh, harmful by doing it. They didn't mean to demean, they didn't mean to make fun of it. It wasn't anything like that. It was, it was in the most reverent and respectful manner that they did it and, and I believe that they should be respected as such. So here, here's what happened. Uh, Okido, Tobias, uh, I believe he was a teenager at the time. Now, you know, his father is grooming him to be the next in the line of the Bamberg magicians. And, uh, and he's, he's uh, ice skating on a pond, and the ice breaks, and he falls through into fr freezing water. And it's quite some time before they fish him out of the water. And uh, it's looking like he might not survive. Well, he does survive. And, uh, but what happens is his, his hearing is impaired. So now he has a challenge. And, you know, folks, um, we face challenges from time to time in our lives. We all do. We all have obstacles that we have to overcome. Now, this could have been a career-ending accident for, for the young Okito. Uh, and what a shame it would have been because Okido has given so much magic to the magic community uh, that it's hard to imagine what, what our history would have been without Okido. So, <clears throat> he's, he, he's, his hearing is impaired. Uh, his ability to do a talking act has been curtailed. So, in the recovery process, he makes the decision to do a silent act and at the time, there was a, a, an aura of mystery surrounding the Orient, if you will. And so he decides to develop a silent act in, in Chinese attire. Now, it, this is kind of funny. It's a little bit of a trivia. The name Okito is a variant on the name Tokyo. So it's a Japanese name, but he performed in Chinese attire. So... <laughs> He did. Uh, but that, that's how he became Okito. It, it, it was in response to a disability. Now, his hearing later returned, but by then he developed the act. Okito. And During Okito's European tour, his wife Lily became pregnant with David. Okito ran six months, returning came to the United States. He ran six months on the Orbrium circuit signed by Agent Martin Beck. On the money he made from performing as a keto, he opened the Bamberg Magic and Novelty Company with Joe Klein in New York City. Here he created exclusive magic tricks for magicians such as Harry Keller, Frederick Eugene Powell, and many, many others. 
His father eventually toured and created magic for Howard Thurston. David assisted in the Thurston show. And David also assisted his father in Quito on stage as well. This is a later image of David Bamberg. This is a young image of David Bamberg. This is a later image uh, in the summer of 1917 at the age of 13 years old. Uh, David Bamberg became one of the Zanzigs. The Zanzigs uh, at the time were the most famous, most prominent. They would have been the Darren Brown of the time. Uh, they were the most famous and most prominent of the stage mentalists of the period. David would later perform as Psycho the Psychic. Psycho being spelled S-Y-K-O. Psycho the Psychic. In England, David attended performances at, at the at the Masculine Family Magic Theater known as St. George's Hall. So what I'm setting up for you here is young David Bamberg grows up performing with his family. And when we spend time, he's eight years old, even younger. He's performing in the Okido show. His father uh, semi-retires or retires to New York running a magic shop. He takes his son to Martinka's where he's exposed to Harry Houdini. Later, he tours with Harry Thurston. What I'm saying is that this young man got an education like no other in history. So, in, in 1923, David attended performances at the Masculine Family Theater St. George's Hall. I mentioned that uh, David developed the act that would become the basis for his touring Grand Illusion show from material he found in Tarbell. Now, it's, also, it's, it's often said that David Bamberg got his whole show out of Tarbell. That is partially true. David Bamberg uh, subscribed to, at the time it was a correspondence course. Now later in volume five, uh, volume five is, is uh, there's a whole chapter devoted to the Bamberg magic. And then still later on, uh, you get some of David Bamberg's illusions exposed in Tarbell, including the girl from light or the lady from light, which is one of my favorite illusions. Uh, but David, David did develop the, uh, the basic act, his, his foundational act, from the Tarbell Course of Magic, and that should not be missed. <clears throat> Many people look at Tarbell and say, you know, uh, what, what can I do with this material? Well, David Bamberg performed professionally with material from Tarbell. Now, that performed the basis of his act. It wasn't his entire act, but the financial backing of film industry executive named William uh, Gawke, I think that's how you pronounce it, G-A-U-L-K-E, uh, David created the Fu Manchu show. Now, Fu Manchu, uh, Fu Manchu was, was a commercial character. Fu Manchu was a popular character in novels, later in film. Dr. Fu Manchu, as he was called, is a fictional villainous character who was introduced in a series of novels by the English author Sax Romer during the first half of the 20th century. The character was also extensively featured in cinema, television, radio, comic strips, and comic books for over 90 years. And he has also become an archetype of the evil criminal genius and mad scientist... According to his own account, Sax Romer, without any prior knowledge and understanding of Chinese culture, decided to start the Dr. Fu Manchu series after his Ouija board spelled out C-H-I-N-A-M-A-N while he asked it what would make his fortune. So here's the story, folks. Uh, the author is having an Ouija session. And he asked the Ouija board, how do I make my fortune in fiction as a writer? And it spells out, create, you know, basically create a Chinese character. And so based on, based on guidance from a Ouija board, he creates the Fu Manchu character. Now David, David, uh, he knew about the fictional Fu Manchu character. So, you know, if, again, if I had been David Bamberg, I might have decided on a different name. You know, but, but he liked the Fu Manchu character. He liked the associations. And, uh, and so he, he, he took the name. Now, the thing is, he could not, because of copyright infringement, he could not perform in the United States uh, as Fu Manchu which was okay. Back in these days, 
Howard Thurston really dominated the circuit. And Blackstone, these guys, you know, if you you were you were finding it, you would find it hard pressed to work in the United States. Dante worked in, in other countries. A lot of a lot of great magicians, Carter the Great, uh, would would tour uh, other countries uh, because because the United States was so saturated. Uh, and so dominated by some of the some of the bigger shows. So um, David Bamberg never really intended to work the United States. Now he eventually did work the United States, and when he did, he had to use another name. The Fu Manchu show became the most extravagant and superb show in the world. Imagine that. Imagine that. Di Vernon, Jack Wynn, and Gene Huger said it was the finest show they'd ever seen, and they saw all the shows. So, uh, you know, David Bamberg took his heritage as a Bamberg and all he learned from his father, Akito, and he built on it and he, he, he developed the biggest show in the world. Now, at that point, he was moving past Tarbell, I can tell you that. David was able to use the Fu Manchu name in other nations, but in March of 1937, when he came back to the United States, he had to change his name to avoid a lawsuit. He, he was billed as Fu Chan when he toured in the United States. He later starred... David Bamberg later became a movie star, and he became a very close associate of Orson Welles. I'm going to talk about that in a second. So, he was a very close friend of Orson Welles. David Copperfield, now, you know, you got to be a big fan of David Copperfield and know your history a little bit with David Copperfield to remember this, but I remember the first time I saw it, and uh, it, was a, it was a card trick that David Copperfield did, and... Uh, and it, it blew me away because of, not the card trick, I mean, the card trick was very basic. And that's, David Copperfield does basic things, but he brings a sense of showmanship to them that elevates them to a whole new stratosphere. So here's the basic effect, right? He has, um, he has a large television screen and a very young, now th this, is, this is one of the things that makes the effect so mysterious, because at this point, David, uh, Orson Welles has either passed away or he's very old. And so uh, he gets this uh, instructional video from Orson Welles. And Orson Welles says, David, now on the video, David, have a card selected. So David has a card selected from a member of the audience. David, uh, shuffle it back into the, and so Orson Welles is addressing him as David, right? And then eventually Orson Welles, in the video, produces the card that's selected by the member of the audience. It's great effect. Well... This was an, a routine that Orson Welles worked out for David Bamberg. And David Copperfield got a hold of the video. I didn't know the video existed. I'm not sure anybody knew it existed. But Copperfield gets a hold of it and, uh, and uses it as if Orson Welles is speaking to David Copperfield. So it's a, it's a brilliant routine. But, uh, but Orson Welles and, 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 and uh, David Bamberg were really good friends. In later years, uh, David Bamberg retired in uh, Buenos Aires, uh, where he opened his own magic shop and, and mentored uh, young magicians. Uh, another thing I want to mention about, uh, this by the way, this is Fu Manchu character right here. Another thing I want to mention about David uh, Bamberg is uh, his show, the Fu Manchu show, was seen by the creators of Le Grand David. And it was the Fu Manchu show that inspired Le Grand David. So, uh, a lot of heritage here. Uh, now, a little story about um, <coughs> one, of the, one of the branches of magic that I'm interested in. And, uh, and I've toyed with over the years. I haven't done an act yet. I, I plan to. I plan to. I haven't done it yet. But I love shadowography. A shadowography is the art of producing animated shadows. So you have a light here and you have a screen and you're creating shadows with your hands. That's shadowography. So here's, a, here's an interesting little story. Uh, David Bamberg is young, he's a teenager. And uh, maybe he's younger, maybe he's, maybe he's uh, eight, nine, 10. I'm not sure what his age was exactly, but he comes home from school one day. They're living in New York at this point. His mother's hysterical. His dad, Akito, had attempted suicide. Now, you know, this, this breaks my heart. Um, you might recall that I did a, a, a session on Animan. Animan not only attempted suicide many, many times, but he succeeded. So he, he died of uh, suicide. Uh, Okito survived. He survived his attempt. 
And while he was recovering in bed uh, over uh, several weeks, uh, David Bamberg sat at his side, and Okido taught his son to do shadowography in bed, recovering from his suicide attempt. And so shadowography continued to be a part of his act for the rest of his life. And, uh, you know, I, I tell you what, I saw, um, there was a film made many years ago, uh, a Dracula version. I think Gary Oldham might have been the star, maybe. And uh, Winona Ryder was in this version. And it was an interesting film in that the shadows in the film were very expressive, almost like expressionist cinema of the early part of the 20th century. Uh, but I was fascinated by the use of shadow in the film. Later I found out that the shadows were produced by a shadowography expert and magician who toured with a small company of magicians. He came to Baltimore. I went to see him. Now imagine this. I'm sitting in a theater and shadows are creeping down creeping down the walls toward the stage. I mean, it, it took shadowography to a whole new level. And, and uh, you know, anything that you, you learn the basis of and you elaborate on, it, it can really get great. And so uh, shadowography is, is a much neglected branch of magic today. I, I'd like to see it come back. I'm going to try to make it come back myself. Anyway, some references on David Bamberg. This right here is one of his works, Illusion Show, A Life in Magic by David Bamberg. Uh, get this book, read this book. Here, here's why, here's why. This man lived during the Golden Age. He worked and developed during the Golden Age. He knew all the great magicians. And this is full of anecdotes about those great magicians and his first-hand knowledge of them. Now, I want to share some things with you. So, here's page five. Page five. <coughs> Akito, Akito is retiring to New York and he's opening up his own shop and he decides to sell his act. Now, you know, imagine buying the Akito act, right? Well, somebody did. Somebody bought the act and uh, they went out and toured with the exact act that Akito was doing and they weren't successful and they came back to complain to Akito. Here's what David Bamberg has to say. No magician can take over another man's show and make a success of it. Let me read that again. No magician can take over another man's show and make a success, a success of it. Every successful magic show is geared to the personality of its creator. Let me read that again too. Every successful magic show is geared to the personality of its creator. Now there's there's another another page that I would like to share with you. Uh, as you know, uh, if you look down at my history, you'll see that the that the history of the sawing illusion is probably my most popular video, uh, other than the zigzag video, uh, which is a performance video. But my lecture videos uh, of of those videos, of the more recent videos, the the sawing in half uh, is is very popular now. He has a lot to say about the sawing illusion here. And I'd like, I'd like to share some of this with you. He says, uh, There can be no doubt that Percy Selbit revived it in London in the early 20s. In his version, the girl's neck, wrists, and ankles were tied with ropes. And he goes on to give the description of the Selbin, uh, Selbit uh, sawing. Then he goes and he explains what happened with this golden selbit issue. Golden used the original selbit method for a time in 1920, but due to, the, to a fearful row with the husband of an acrobatic woman who was the victim in the illusion, Golden fired them both. In revenge, the husband sold the secret of the trick to a cinema company who exposed the full working details in a short film. This forced Golden to think of another method, and he came up with a pull-apart boxes showing the head and feet of the girl in full view. Selbit and Golden made a rush for the United States in order to be the first to present this new sensation, but, while, while, but the Willie Golden slapped a court order on Selbit in New York, and his sewing illusion was seized and destroyed. 
This started the great battle of the, of the divided woman. Golden loved lawsuits and was forever suing and stopping other magicians from doing certain illusions. So basically what Golden did was he would purchase an illusion or he'd steal it either way. And he would, he would apply for a patent on the, on the illusion. And if he was granted the patent, then he would sue other magicians who tried to do it. That was Golden's style. Anyway, I thought that was an interesting little tidbit on, on the sawing illusion. One more thing I want to share with you. This is page six. It says, um, it isn't always the greatest artist who has the most success. People would say he's not a good magician, but he is a good showman. On the one hand, there, are, there were the audacious, publicity-minded men of whom Houdini was undoubtedly the king. Men with forceful personalities, but to be honest, not skilled magicians. So he's saying that Houdini was not a skilled magician. But he was audacious, and he was a publicity hound. Now he goes on to say, Keller, Thurston, Nicola, Carter, Raymond, and Golden all fell into this class. In other words, they were great businessmen. They were great at getting publicity. They were great showmen. But according to David Bamberg, they weren't the artist. Not one of them, in the true sense of the word, was a great artist. The shows they presented were high-powered, flashy, and based on the greatest delusions ever invented, and all these men made fortunes in magic. Then, there were the trained technicians, mostly shy, retiring men, Watir Dakota, Survey Leroy, Percy Selbit, Oswald Williams, Paul Valadone, Owen Clark, Louis Nicola, Maskeline, and Okito. These men were the greatest magic inventors in history, but most of them were financial failures. I really like that contrast between the showmen and the inventors. And you rarely get both in the same person. It's, it's a little bit like songwriting. You know, you get, you get great songwriters and you get great performers. Now, in, in some cases in music, you get, you get them both in the same person. But in, in magic, it's true. You know, I think it's, it's one personality type that creates great magic. Uh, Jim Steinmeier comes to mind. You know, it, it's another personality that performs that magic. David uh, uh, David Copperfield and uh, Doug Henning come to mind. So anyway, I want to give you some references on David Bamberg. If you're interested in more information, this is Illusion Show: A Life in Magic. Uh, it was written by David Bamberg. I, I highly recommend it to you. Uh, Tarbell Volume 5. I'm pointing over here because that's where my Tarbell set is. Tarbell Volume 5 has the magic of the Bambergs in it. Uh, also in Tarbell is The Girl from Light. Now this is, has always been uh, one of my favorite illusions. Uh, first time I saw it, David Copper, I mean uh, Doug Henning did it. It's a beautiful illusion. If you can imagine a, a box made of paper, you show the box with a light Put the light down in the center and a shadow appears inside the box and a person materializes. I think when David, when uh, Doug Henning did it, he produced himself, although uh, he's also produced other people that way. But it's a great illusion and it's, and it's often attributed to uh, David Bamberg. So that's in Tarbell. All that material is in Tarbell. Then you have a book called The Oriental Magic of the Bambergs by Robert Albo. This book, uh, it's, it's one of the rare books that I do not have in my collection, so I can't hold it up and show you. Uh, but I do have this one, Illusion Builder to Fu Manchu, and it is chock full of great material. And so, and it's chock full of also the history of, uh, of Fu Manchu, David Bamberg. So it is uh, fantastic. I love this book. It's one of my favorites when it comes to illusioning, illusion building, illusion craft, uh, grand illusion. Folks, that is, that's my 10 cents worth on David Bamberg, a.k.a. Fu Manchu. I hope you enjoyed it. Please comment below. I love your comments. Make any request you want. I, I would love to attend to your requests. 
Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already. I will see you next time. Take care.